Muy buenas tardes eh, a todos y todas que nos acompañan en el día de hoy. Eh, iniciamos nuestro, nuestra, eh, nuestro webinar eh, titulado Fortalecimiento de la capacidad resolutiva del primer nivel de atención en el marco de la pandemia eh, COVID-19. Eh, tenemos eh, en el día de hoy una eh, sesión donde revisaremos experiencias de tres países eh, y también el marco de trabajo eh, y las recomendaciones de la OPS para eh, fortalecer eh, el, nivel, el primer nivel de atención en épocas tan difíciles. Nos acompañan eh, hoy una, un grupo de colegas que iré presentando de acuerdo a, eh, eh, el momento, pero eh, de primera intención eh, invito al doctor James Fitzgerald, nuestro director del Departamento de Sistemas y Servicios de Salud de la OPS, para que nos dé las palabras de bienvenida y la introducción. Well, thank you very much, uh, Amalia. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as part of this introduction, uh, Amalia, I think it's important that we Uh, present a little bit of the context of um, of what we are actually seeing in the region of the Americas uh, over the past uh, few months during this uh, really challenging time. Um, within this context, we have really seen um, uh, significant efforts on all member states to reconfigure and reorganize the um, health services in particular Um, particular really the uh, organization delivery of, of those services at, at various levels. Um, I have a few slides for you that I wanted to present and I'm hoping that you can see them. But here is an initial analysis that indicates to you uh, the challenges that some of the countries have been facing in increasing the number of hospital beds to be dealing with um, COVID-19 patients. In this case, a sample of eight countries. Now we've seen Countries have really had to work very hard to reconfigure, reorganize, and surge capacity within, within hospitals um, to provide care, and, and in particular within the context of ICU care. Um, what has happened as a consequence? Well, we will see in the presentation a little bit later, but um, there has been a, an important effort at this level of care, which has resulted also in impacts with regard to the provision of care at other levels of, within, the, within the health system. Uh, in a survey that has been carried out by PAHO as part of the WHO Pulse Service uh, in 19 countries, we've surveyed um, key services, key essential health services to see what has been happening over the past six months. Uh, what we can actually see, and here is just a very brief overview to give you an indication of the uh, disruptions that have occurred in all types of services um, across the health systems and across all countries. In particular, we see services such as dental services, and rehabilitation services significantly impacted, but other services also have been the subject of, of such disruption. Um, in fact, countries have taken specific action um, to, with regard to uh, intentionally scaling back service provision, um, particularly at outpatient, inpatient and community uh, levels, what we call uh, essentially the first level of care. Um, some of them completely suspending care, others uh, limiting access in terms of the provision of care, while we see that emergency and pre-hospital emergency services potentially are less impacted. Only 5 to 11%, for example, of potentially life-saving emergency services have been directly uh, impacted, whereas the inpatient critical care services have been impacted to a greater degree. But when we get to some of the services that are really provided at the primary care level, we see um, significantly different results. For example, the routine immunization services have been drastically impacted over the period with, uh, with countries reporting a 42% reduction um, in the provision of such services. Similarly, in terms of family planning and contraception, as well as antenatal care. And in some of our countries, probably most at risk, we are already seeing an increase in maternal mortality as a consequence of these uh, disruptions. With regard to communicable disease services, we see a mixed flag. Um, obviously, the outbreak detention control um, of diseases, including non for non-COVID diseases, has been less impacted. Uh, TB case management and ARV treatment has, has continued with some levels of impact. But we see a particular increase uh, or significant impacts in terms of disruptions of services that are more focused on prevention and promotion, for example, with regard to indoor residual spraying or insecticide treatment, 
uh, for, for nets. These, these services are, are really key in, in terms of preventing malaria. And we, we, it remains to see what the impacts in, in terms of the, the transmission of malaria will be as we move forward within the region. In terms of NCDs, NCDs is a particular concern. Um, we're really happy to have Dr. Anson Hennis with us, uh, who will provide closing remarks as well, who's the Director of uh, uh, Non-Communicable Diseases and Mental Health here. Um, but NCDs, we, we see significant impact as well, and this is of particular importance given that uh, some of these NCDs uh, constitute important underlying conditions for the impact of COVID-19. Uh, treatment for mental health disorders has been, been impacted to the extent that we're seeing in the order of about 20% uh, at the same time while uh, services, requests for services in this area has increased significantly. Cancer treatment in particular um, as an essential health service, not just within the first level of care, but throughout the health service network has been disrupted uh, to an important extent. On the positive side, we see that 80% of countries have already defined uh, essential health services. And here within the context of, uh, and the conceptual uh, framework of essential health services, we are referring not just to services at the first level of care, but the referral counter referral systems and the necessary services that are required through the integrated health service network. Um, additionally, countries have defined uh, the essential health services that they uh, are prioritizing within um, the context of COVID-19 and we see that essentially 60% of countries have, uh, have provided additional resources to the provision of those services. That's an expanse as to, as to the reason for these service disruptions. We can see uh, supply disruptions, for example, relation to government or public transport lockdowns, the implementation of public health measures, um, the redeployment of the clinical staff that are required uh, to increase the capacity, particularly in hospitals we saw earlier during the presentation. Or it can be uh, demand side factors where essentially people are not presenting themselves to the first level of care or seeking care, um, or indeed there's cancellations relating to, to elective care. Um, but most countries have already implemented a series of approaches to mitigate these service disruptions, such as triaging um, and identifying priorities in telemedicine strategies. We've seen, for example, that the predominant strategies implemented are triaging and the task shifting uh, of the roles of human resources for health and delegation of other functions to, to other um, health services uh, professionals. Uh, in addition, there has been uh, a, a real extent of look at patient flows within the health system, redirecting patients to alternative healthcare facilities and ensuring that the necessary community outreach uh, has occurred to inform the population of disruptions and changes. So with that, um, Amalia, I will hand back to you. I think that presents for us the, the current context in which we found ourselves in. I hope this initial presentation has been informative to lay, uh, lay the groundwork for the discussion moving forward. Many thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, James. Y ahora voy a pedir al doctor eh, José Miguel Angulo de la Caja Costarricense de Seguridad Social, eh, que es el director de área de atención integral a las personas, que, que inicie con su presentación. Esta sesión, como mencioné, eh, eh, tocará experiencias de tres países eh, que esperamos sean bastante eh, eh, innovadoras. Eh, doctor José Miguel Angulo, le paso el micrófono. Gracias. Buenas tardes. De, mi nombre es José Miguel Angulo, soy el jefe de área de atención a las personas, nos encargamos del análisis de situación, planificación, diseño y protocolización del proceso de atención y también intervenimos en alguna manera en la fase de evaluación. Hoy nos acompaña este, también la doctora Jacqueline Monge, que es la jefe de la Coordinación Nacional de Enfermería. Todo un reto, 10, 15 minutos para, para hablar de una respuesta a país, supongo que los demás compañeros deben estar pasando lo mismo. Entre más cosas hay que decir y menos tiempo, más grande es el esfuerzo en consolidar y llevar a, este, a una presentación de consenso. Pero vamos a tratar de, 
de, de, desarrollar, el, de desarrollar la presentación con, para darnos a entender lo mejor posible y después habrá un espacio para ampliar. Este es un esquema de planificación, pudo haber sido visión objetivo, este es el esquema de planificación de visión estratégica, nada más para darnos a entender la magnitud de lo que movió, como lo dijo el doctor Figuera, el, el tema de COVID. Nuevos datos para analizar, nueva, hay que definir, definir el problema en términos de vulnerabilidad, trascendencia, sensibilidad a la prevención. Hay que dimensionar COVID. Sensitivity. And we have to give the dimension to COVID while taking care of all the other health issues. So the health plans that had to be redesigned, the national plan, change our strategies, change policies, define where to invest our resources and uh, to conduct a number of processes to adapt issues and technical and if evaluation and also evaluation of care. And we held a meeting with our colleagues from other departments in order to determine indicators for equality. Now, the uh, indicators that we had for personal care is no longer applicable. And that's just one example. As I told you, it is, in the case of COVID, it's important to define the problem. If you don't understand its importance of vulnerability, sensitivity to prevention, alternative diagnosis and treatment, without that, it's very difficult to treat an unknown enemy. Likewise, you need a complete evaluation of the conditions and determinants of the problem. So that for that, you need primary sources of information as well as secondary ones. And over time, we have been working on this when it comes on evidence-based medicine in order to make decisions. We are evaluating the use of uh, face masks in some specific cases, if we can uh, that way control transmission a little bit. So we need to look at all the reports and look at all the evidence-based medicine. There's nothing that is pro or contra, any different alternative. And we need to do what, see what we can do about the obligation of wearing face masks. Sometimes we have information, but other times there is no information available. And to this, we must add the situation of primary sources when it comes to contagion. Learning from PAHO and the important advisors that have helped us, Dr. Alberto Barceló, Dr. Del Aguila, Margarita Romero, lots of people who have taught us that all the care process, whether active or reactive, but it has to be made systematic. So we had worked on a proactive system, but in the case of COVID, we had to combine reactive and proactive measures. We could not really wait till the interventions were systematized. The key elements for the care system with people suffering from chronic diseases, it's a, a model that has, uh, the wand and cock was helpful. But we need to understand the care model, look at the, the human resources, material, equipment, etc. Regardless of the new model, I still have a number of needs and I need to organize my resources and that will then become my care model. There are serious cases. We need to ensure the system's sensitivity, for instance. The interpreter cannot hear the speaker any longer. We have lost communication with him. We cannot set aside quality. Whatever we do will be better or worse than what it was. So it is impossible to not link the technical standardization documents. Then the inventory of community policies is something we'll see later in care of for COVID with a local health care system. There's a lot of bibliographic background, a lot of effort, a lot of theory. And at last we find a health issue where all that inventory becomes useless. When organizing healthcare based on evidence, we need to come up with an information system supporting the delivery of services. Information is vital for decision making, both for the diagnosis, situation analysis, as well as the planning phase, and to support the delivery of service. 
Conventionally, what we see in the press releases every day at noon time, and it is shared with the population in general, the authorities, the uh, president, the ministers, presidents of institutions, or whatever expert is required. This is the information that is made public every day. This is from a few days ago. Just to give you an example, we have confirmed cases, the new cases, when there is a link or no link, then the national and foreign patients. All people affected by COVID who need to resort to services. Dr. Angulo, somebody is interrupting. If you could speak a little bit slower, that will allow the interpreters to follow you better. Yes, I will try, says the speaker. So this is the information, as I was saying, that is made available every day. It's shared with media through press briefings. Here you see the active cases, the age ranges, uh, the accumulated cases, the recoveries and death. So this is a bulletin that is made available on the webpage of the Ministry of Health as well as those of the institution. Here we have distribution by province, province residents and condition. The patient is identified as time, time and place. They have an epidemiological chart prepared for them and the data is then fed into the system. So this is daily information. It's issued seven days a week. It is updated continuously to see the disease's behavior. This is made available to the public. And here we are doing similar actions that you are doing for our analysis of the situation. And we need to now enter a new phase. As I was saying, the case definition, the case notification, the complexity of the case, and where the care will be provided, surveillance of contact, etc. Just the way you do it is the way we are also doing it. But it is crucial. And this is phase one in researching the disease prior to community transmission, which is what we are currently seeing, because we don't yet have the herd immunity. Like in any other health system, it is no possible always to trace all the contacts. Now we're entering a second phase. Now it is a vulnerable population, vulnerable to being hospitalized because they have uh, disabilities and it's also tied to mortality rates. When it comes to epidemiological, these are not useful because there's nothing that can be done for those patients, but actually mortality data is still very useful because through the case analysis of the 700 plus people that have gone through this process, process we have identified the people who were fragile, fragile being understood as diminished uh, abilities. It could be cardiac insufficiencies, different uh, heart problems and uh, respiratory issues. So when they have a diminished uh, capacity, they may have OC obstructive pulmonary disease, OCD. Then there are patients that may have chronic kidney disease. They may be in different phases and patients also suffering from a disability or can, cannot conduct their daily activities such as get dressed, feed, bathe, etc. And that's when you have a group of population patients with uh, TIAs or other cardiopathies and chronic diseases. That group of vulnerable people are the ones that we are currently seeing and who are in intensive care, and that is the epidemiological profile. Official data will be made available. There is a commission that has been established looking at case by case to classify population. Then, then we move on to phase two to organize the response. Who is going to be sent to a hospital? Who will be cared for at home? And there we have to take all necessary measures. 
Here we have an, the country divided in cantons. We need to look into mortality due to underlying chronic diseases and make the necessary changes. Premature mortality due to um, strokes or to a heart attack or due to diabetes, mortality due to chronic kidney disease, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is no longer the conventional data. We are now using a different set of data for this population that is at high risk that is going to fill the hospital beds to protect the family and the community resources and not expose them to the herd That type of patient, patients that are fragile, receive special monitoring. And here the health system is important as a way of organizing care. That is something that reflects our geographic and social sensitivity. Now, in terms of guaranteeing access and here, we have to look at uh, our population. We have people that live on the streets. We have indigenous population. We have people that have HIV. So we have to assure social sensitivity. And all of these vulnerable groups need special attention. That is the indigenous population. They are days away in terms of transportation. So the attention of this target group is especially difficult in times of COVID. Now, in terms of the response, we have these different health areas, 105, and this is headed by a general physician, a nursing assistant, and also a primary health care doctor. That is our basic structure, and they deal with a population that varies in size. The main thing is the density of the population and also our attention, our care is in keeping with what is needed in the area. Also, we have a level of complexity. Sometimes the cost, the second level complexity comes in. And also we look at comprehensive health care, integrated care, and we have better resources available, more technology available in the large cities. Now, all of this is organized. Everything follows a protocol, a referral protocol, etc. Now, let's look at the first level of care. This is promotion, education of our patients. That's basically community participation. We'll get to that in a few minutes the communication process, the language and keeping with the procedures and practices and keeping with the diagnostic scheme. Then prevention, as I said, we have a personal and user protection measures that has to do with wearing masks, washing, etc. Definition of the population at risk, also reporting cases and care. Now that has to do with diagnosis and treatment and continuing the therapeutical plan. And no longer are we going to have local educational programs, but we have platforms to provide education. Now that is the case of adolescents. Now, if you need other professionals to involve get involved in care, we mainly have to focus on diagnosis and treatment. Now, protecting our staff, that requires training. It also means gear or equipment and standards. We have to contain and reduce the number of deaths because of the disease. We talked about surveillance, reporting, monitoring, etc. And now with the vulnerable population, the population, that have complications or comorbidities. And also we have to cooperate in the research that's going on for treatment alternatives. Now we talked about detecting an early detection of people at risk. That's the elderly adults, fragile patients, uh, people that live in long-term facilities, families at risk, social vulnerability, also 
we look at per capita income because that has to do with access to health care services. Now, we have been educated in terms of vulnerability and everything that we have to do complying with the treatment plan that has to do with supply and distribution of medication. And not only do we have to follow up on malaria, Zika, and other diseases at the same time. Now, the populations that are fragile here, the decreased respiratory vital capacity, reduction of the ejection fraction, but uh, there are things that are more pathognomonic, things that diagnose the disease, things that you can you can diagnose without uh, introducing a catheter. If you need to, you do, to diagnose a chronic renal disease. Also here, the lack of ability to perform the daily activities. All of this looking at the vulnerable populations that are going to fill up our hospitals and those that will be reflected in our death statistics. Here, a deficit imbalance and also immunosuppression, both primary and secondary. Sometimes our patients are uh, not uh, balanced in terms of their vital signs. So all of those vulnerable populations, that requires a maximum effort to protect them. Now, at the present time, there's a group of colleagues that are organizing the process for a pilot. This is working with the highly vulnerable populations so as to protect those populations. There have been some publications having to do with community transmission and also organizing the local healthcare system, also drawing up an inventory and activating the community response. All of this so as to provide protection measures for these highly vulnerable populations. Now, regarding organizing the health system to organize and guarantee social and geographic access and enhancement of the supply of the inventory care. Now, this depends not so much on health services, but it depends on a whole community effort that targets the protection of the vulnerable population, developing intersectoral, interregional partnerships. So it is an effort that spans the whole country. Yes, this is led by the ministry, but it is our society that responds. Here we have civil society, NGOs, the private sector, the Ministry of Justice of Education, the National Social Security Institute, the Ministry of Health, municipalities, churches, development of intersectoral partnerships. So we have that uh, National Commission for Emergencies, and there are different actors that come in as necessary. And then the command center of the services is made up of all of the managers, managers of those organizations that provide an emergency response. Now, we're cooperating in researching new treatment alternatives. There is the use of ventilators created by TEC. Also, there is a registry of results of applying horse serum in patients with light COVID, slight COVID, and also partnerships with others. And here we are hoping for the presence of a future vaccine. Also, delivery of medication by mail to Costa Rica. Also using horse serum, working with UCR, taking samples with the National uh, Reference Laboratory, that's in Ciencia. They do PCR testing, also delivery of health orders, working with the Ministry of Health, and then hospital beds with the National uh, Social Security Institute. Because um, we know we, we send an email to we send an email. Send a... ¿Qué eso? ¿Qué pasó ahí? <laughs> what happened? Doctor Angulo, le habla. Director Angulo, this is Amalia del Riego, the moderator. But you're basically out of time, Doctor. 
So could you try to wrap up? Thank you. Okay, I will conclude. The design of the organization of services is important. Everything having to do with the care process for those suspected with having COVID. We do a separation of cases, COVID and non-COVID, according to our suspicion. The main thing is to lower the death rate because of this disease in terms of what we were asked to supply regarding our investment in infrastructure. We have 626 employees more to substitute or to deal with the new COVID units. We increased the number of beds and we have new modalities of consultation that is making good use of technology, doing virtual consultation. We use different platforms, SIF web, SIF mobile, Zoom, everything necessary so as to be able to communicate with our patients. Everything having to do with remote care, that too. And then all of the documents on technical standardization. We have one of the authors here with us and they are working in the area of uh, human remains disposal, also mental health, etc., And all of the actions having to do with personal and user protection. As I was saying, thank you. I know that I just raced through this. It is hard to tell you the whole response of a country in 10 or 15 minutes. So I hope that this was very straightforward. I hope that uh, I showed you how we're revamping our healthcare system, the investments we have made, so as to be able to address this emerging disease, COVID. And also we are trying to deal with everything that we had planned to deal with. So this is difficult, but it's basically very hard to give you a complete answer in such a short period of time. So in any case, we are definitely at your disposal if you have any further questions on this whole process. We can tell you about our lab tests, all of the measures we have taken to deal with COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Angulo. And yes, it is a challenge to be able to summarize the experience of a country in 15 minutes, but we are going to take advantage of the Q&A to be able to get into greater detail. With that, I call on Dr. Casimiro Caña. He is going to be presenting the experience of Jamaica. So here we're moving up to the Caribbean. Casimiro is a PAHO health advisor in Jamaica. Casimiro, please go ahead. Casimiro? Casimiro? Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Cannot start while the others. Oh, uh, can, can I have the, it says that I cannot share my screen. Um, can I have the um, authorization to, oh, here, sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Very nice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for for the invitation and for, um, for organizing the webinar. I think it's a great webinar. Um, and as countries are, um, sorry, as as countries are tackling the COVID nineteen pandemic with the new and uncertain challenges, it becomes key to share 
country experiences, um, create knowledge and innovation for strengthening the health system and improve our response. So thank you so much um, for the invitation and for this webinar. I think this is great. Um, let me just present uh, very quickly the situation in currently in Jamaica. And I think this slide also explains you know, why the, the chief medical officer of Jamaica was not able to join us today, unfortunately, to make a presentation herself. Uh, so I'll do to highlight some, as the colleague says, you know, not, not to go through everything, but highlight some of the key points of strengthening first level of care for the COVID-19. You know, we are uh, currently with the surge of, of, of cases. Uh, the situation has been classified as community transmission since uh, to the 2nd of September with 5,510 total cases, uh, 423 active cases with 77 deaths. Here to highlight that 60% and 60 of the total cases are in two number of uh, cases in Kingston and Jamaica. Um, so that is the situation. Uh, you know, there, the, the surge of COVID-19 cases has put the, the, the health system currently under pressure. Uh, this is the data from the level of occupancy rate. You can see, um, you can see here that uh, the ICU beds are now on 50%. Uh, uh, the high dependency unit beds, 89%, uh, and then isolation uh, beds, 76% uh, overall, uh, but particularly in the Southeast region, which includes Kington, uh, 98%. So it's, it's um, as you say, that there's one bed available. So, but other, other uh, regions still have capacity uh, under 50%. So that, that shows a bit of the pressure that the system is currently uh, uh, facing. Um, you know, the capacity for the health system to deal with the current surge of cases was significantly strained uh, since the first case of COVID in 10th of March uh, up to the community transmission in September. So there was um, time enough from March to September to prepare the health system for the current surge. Uh, we know based on the hospital readiness checklist uh, and the modeling of COVID-19 cases and estimation of beds, uh, there was a significant increase, so it was planned a significant increase of beds. Uh, so we can see an increase from 10 uh, to 28 critical care beds, almost three times more uh, in terms of critical care beds, and isolation beds or hospital beds for COVID-19 from 15 to 30, 325. So there was a very significant expansion of the capacity. And of course, here also, you know, establishing a central bed management system that is able to ensure the use of these uh, um, available beds and optimize the existing capacity. Currently, because of the surge, the Ministry of Health is now establishing four field units uh, with, also with small, so these are not those big field units that uh, in some cases we can see. Here we're talking about four field units in hospitals with 30 to 40 beds, um, uh, so increasing capacity of 120 beds. But here, and I think in the case of Jamaica, you know, besides the expansion of the hospital bed capacity, the focus was uh, really in strengthening uh, the first level of care. Um, and you can see here in the map, the dots are the first level of care, 318 health centers that has, have a key role to play in the response to the COVID-19. Uh, these efforts you know, were prior to the COVID-19, the focus on, on, on the first level of care. Uh, the Ministry of Health has set a vision for 2030 uh, for the next three years, and this sets the strategic directions uh, and the priorities for strengthening a health system based on the first level of care. Uh, um, and the vision for Health 2020 sets so the, the primary health care renewal um, that, that you know, includes a restructuration of the network of the 380 uh, primary health centers uh, in three in three levels, as you can see in the graph, a community, district, and comprehensive health center. And this comprehensive health center is a new, is an innovation in terms of, of, of the primary health care. Um, and the objective of establishing these comprehensive health centers are to enhance the resolutive capacity of the first level of care and providing additional specialist and diagnostic services, as well as you know, uh, social uh, support, rehabilitation, and palliative care. So. Um, that is an, a, a, um, one of the key points of this primal care renew, and also uh, outpatient resource center that is basically um, improve 
the, the communication and integration of, of health services uh, with um, the hospital. Uh, and, and here the, there is a strong component of digitalization and improving communication of the network, which I think was very critical uh, in this current times of COVID-19, where we're able to share data without coming in contact to each other. Um, you know, the, the implementation of the vision and the primal scaring new is, 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 um, is, is one of the key projects is the uh, uh, project established by the Ministry of Health uh, for strengthening health systems. It is um, a significant investment in, in the health system, one of the biggest investments in the last years, 100 million US dollars. Um, uh, and, and here with three main components. So, uh, you know, improved infrastructure of 11 health centers. We're not talking about new health centers, but, you know, uh, improving the ones that existed. Uh, establish a model of care uh, for NCDs, um, you know, focus on person and community-based health services, and strengthen the information system with a lot of focus on the digitalization of health services uh, and improve uh, integrated uh, services. So this is a very important project that ensures the implementation of the primary care renewal and the vision 2030. Um, one, you know, one of the points here, the first level of care has proven to be key uh, in the response to the COVID-19 with three main functions. Uh, you know, the response to COVID-19, identify, report, contain, manage, and refer, ensure the continuity of essential services uh, during community transmission as we are now, and reduce the demand in hospitals. So they're able to increase the capacity uh, of the hospital response as we see is now under pressure. As you can see here, the photo, this shows you know, the, health, um, the health center in Jamaica prior to the COVID-19 with crowded waiting rooms. And so here there's now the, the, this focus on redesigning the first level of care, um, limiting the number of provider uh, encounters and make effective use of hotline and web portals to provide guidance for persons to know where should they go within the health system and particularly in the first level of care so that they get the, 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 the health services they need and including also mechanisms for scheduling. Uh, in this case, specifically COVID-19 tests, but I think it opens now a lot of opportunities in terms of also channeling you know, consultations and other uh, health services. Um, and, and here to highlight, you know, one of the, one of the, um, the technologies, the GEM, GEM COVID-19 app, which in the same app, you know, provides information from the Ministry of Health to persons, allows persons to self-report um, their health status and if, if they got any symptoms of COVID, then book appointment for testing, request emergency services. And also for Jamaicans that are abroad, they can, they can, uh, and they can be part of the control re-entry program uh, that the Ministry of Health has put in place. Uh, and the other point is what was mentioned here and the challenges of, you know, um, keep maintaining the essential health services. And here, uh, uh, you know, the government of Jamaica uh, has to make difficult decisions to balance the demand for responding directly to COVID-19 and simultaneously maintaining essential health services delivery. And this has been critical because you see the process has been since March till September this balance has been, um, has been uh, uh, done along the way with a flexibility. Here to highlight you know, the importance of you know, the Ministry of Health has increased capacity uh, in terms of human resources by uh, in, um, additional 120 medical doctors and 100 community health workers to strengthen that capacity at the first level of care to, to but also here particularly important, you know, uh, besides bringing uh, uh, new health workers to ensure they are protected. And it's become you know, uh, very important in terms of ensuring they have access to PPEs and they are trained in infection prevention and control. So they are protected and continue growing. And what we see is as the surge happens now, the number of health professionals infected increases too. So we need to ensure that sustainability in terms of the health workers to maintain the COVID-19, but also the other services. Here is also important, you know, to establish and continuously update the patient, the, the patient flow, uh, including screening, triage, and, and then the referral of COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 to be able to maintain in social services. Um, and here, you know, the main idea of these redesign the health services and maintaining social services is particularly a different approach. 
approach instead of waiting in the health center for people to come, um, you know, to be more proactive uh, and go out and outreach the most vulnerable communities. I see here in the photo is the mobile units that goes to the community, you know, for testing, for consultation, for guidance, but also other uh, uh, services that are now being redesigned in terms of, um, you know, uh, home care or the HEM health that I mentioned with the HEP and of course, a lot of potential on telehealth and teleconsultation, but here the need to ensure, you know, an infrastructure that can able to keep these services in, in a sustained way. You know, to finish, you know, some of the, of, of the challenges and, 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 and here, um, and here, you know, one of the important issues that we're facing now, I think it's, it's, it's uh, um, you know, as, as, the economy reactivates, it's the importance of control the pandemic. Uh, and then at the same time, as the, the economy starts to reactivate, in, increase the likelihood of increasing cases. So here, these complementary and these cover convergences of health policies um, and economic, fiscal, social policies is particularly key because of this interdependence between health and economy. Um, we know this is not new, uh, we know the, um, but the pandemic clearly makes uh, clearly demonstrate this relationship and the importance of addressing both. So, uh, you know, here to highlight in the response since March up to now, a strengthened collaboration with other ministries. Of course, here, as we have been discussing the reopening of schools, a strong collaboration with the Ministry of Education, but also Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Finance, to be able to, as, you know, uh, keeping or reactivating the economy, and at the same time, ensuring the, 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 the health and the response to the COVID-19. So I think that that is one of the key challenges besides other in terms of coordination, uh, um, you know, to, to, to keep the current whole government and whole society approach. And I think that's the other challenging that is facing, uh, which is the need to continuously renew the commitment uh, of the society and the communities to keep, you know, the physical distance, the use of masks and other public health measures as we can see, you know, there are some fatigue of these measures, but we continue need to engage uh, the community uh, um, to, to, to be able to control this uh, these pandemic in Jamaica. So I think that's, that's one of the key challenges. And here in this community engagement, clearly the first level of care has a critical role to play. So first level of care had a critical role till now, and we see now in the surge, uh, even more critical role to play uh, in the future to the response to this COVID-19, uh, but also to, you know, advancing universal health in Jamaica. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your, for your attention. Thank you, Casimiro, and thank you very much for keeping to your time. Now I'm going to call on Dr. Maida Barrios. Dr. Maida Barrios is the National Director of Primary Health Care in Paraguay. So, Dr. Barrios, you have the floor. Good afternoon, and let me begin by thanking you for inviting us to present our experiences here in Paraguay. We will be speaking about the strategic actions of first level of care given the COVID-19 pandemic. The current situation in Paraguay for the first level of care, we have 808 family health units, USF, taking care of some 2.2 million persons. This is a 32% of national coverage of our population. The USF, the units, implement the primary healthcare strategy as the first step for the health system. They are found in 249 districts in the 18th health regions of the country. And this represents 98% of the districts in the country. They are located in areas with a greater population uh, in the vulnerable groups. You can see the georeferencing real-time map showing the USFs in Paraguay, and this is available on the webpage of the ministry. 
The government has strengthened human resources in Paraguay. 11 years ago, we began to implement the primary or first level of care programs, and this government has tried to bridge the gaps between human resources and infrastructure improvements. The units are the physical space where we carry out the activities, and the family health team are the human resources that serve at these units, and they have a number of duties. They need to have a doctor, they need to have nursing auxiliaries, technicians, community health agents, and indigenous health promoters. In the context of the pandemic, 146 human resources have been added to our services, broken down in these expertise areas that I just mentioned, especially completing the staff at the units that were not yet complete. Currently, we have 4,453 professionals throughout the country. Infrastructure strengthening for first level of primary health care. Here again, we have focused on the reconstruction or improvement of 300 units that were currently in existence out of the 808 and expand 402 new ones and add them. That way, we're going to have a 65% coverage of the country. During the pandemic, three new family units were implemented, 30 were updated, and 42 new ones are planned to be completed by year end. This image shows you a current, a small existing unit, and next to it on the right, the current type of structure that we're trying to deploy throughout the country. Moving now to the strengthening of equipment and furnishings to improve care of patients. We have three new units and 42 that are, have been worked on. They'll be totally finished by year end. And 100 fetal heartbeat detectors have been purchased as well as 800 blood oxygen meters for the 18 health regions in the country to be able to provide better support and management of patients. This has been a request especially to con control and detect heartbeat in fetuses because this was sorely needed in Paraguay. Turning to the epidemiological situation, the first Cases in Paraguay appeared in March, and Paraguay adopted measures from the outset, but such as closing our borders, de declare quarantine. And in May, we were just seeing cases that came into the country from other areas on humanitarian flights, and they were housed in settlements, but they were all coming from different countries. Between June and July, and in September also, there has been an increase in cases. And to date, we have 34,260 confirmed cases in the country, of which 14,955 are currently active patients, and we have to make sure that there is no community transmission. The other graph shows the department where the largest number of cases have been identified in the central area. It has 19%, in the capital, Asuncion, 23%, and Alto Paraná, 30%. And this data has been calculated for all areas of the country. This uh, data here is updated as of 22 September for in this presentation, but at the web page of the Ministry of Health, it's up to date. Population coverage in primary health care in regions most afflicted by COVID. The three regions as I mentioned a moment ago, you can see in the central area, the coverage is 19% when we're talking about primary health care. In the capital, it's 23%, and in Alto Paraná, 30% coverage. Regardless of low coverage in these health regions where COVID has had a major impact, the 
first level of care has been restructured in order to care the for the population. Paraguay has been able to respond to requests by the population at the different levels from primary care level to all the other care levels. Let's now talk about the preparation of the primary level. In March, the emergency center was established and a protocol for primary health care was developed. We also socialized the protocol, posting it on the ministry's portal. In April, we began providing virtual training to the 445 4,453 new recruits for primary health care. We also in situ verified implementation of the protocol at the units and later monitored the activities carried out by the family health care teams. So on the web page, we have uh, uploaded our protocol for the management and looking at all the different uh, diseases. It was called management of the primary, of the first level of care, units of fami family health care, given SARS-CoV-2. And this was in the hands of the regional department, receiving technical support from PAHO and all the different agencies dependent upon the Ministry of Health. Let me talk about reorganization and adaptation of surfaces, differentiated access to IRA and non-IRA, guaranteeing a safe flow of patients and the healthcare personnel, use nursing aids to guarantee care for the non-respiratory cases, nursing nurses in Paraguay have taken on this extra load allowing the physicians to care for the respiratory patients, correct use of individual unit uh, equipment, correct use of processes to control infection, guarantee continuity of essential health care services. This includes vaccination, caring for children, PANI, which is the integral nutritional and food program, non-communicable chronic diseases, family planning, and prenatal control. Let me give you some specific examples of the work carried out in Paraguay by the first level of care during the pandemic. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things we did was to ensure that the protocol was fully applied and PAHO supported us to verify this in different regions. Adapt healthcare services, which involves reorganization of services. We have a differentiated access, as I mentioned earlier, of respiratory and non respiratory cases, it's providing washbowls in all services different types of wash bowls, ensure physical dis and social distancing in the waiting rooms. Raising awareness about the importance of social distancing and avoid grouping of persons. We have determined it should be a distance of two meters in the healthcare centers, as well as using face masks, and this is mandatory. There is a follow-up of all types of visits and consultations, telemonitoring of some cases, monitoring suspicious and confirmed cases, as you can see in the photographs, such as care being given to a Burns patient, avoiding complications and guaranteeing the basic services that I mentioned, our chronic patients such as diabetic, high blood pressure, La vacunación de los, en los servicios y en los domicilios, el control prenatal a las embarazadas, para lo cual los profesionales habían solicitado la adquisición de los detectores eh, de latido cardíaco fetal, también la atención del niño dentro del programa PAN y entregándole su complemento nutricional, que son dos kilos de leche que se entrega acá en el, nivel, en el Paraguay. La atención a comunidades indígenas y albergues en las 18 regiones sanitarias se han 
eh, habilitados albergues, de los cuales nueve regiones sanitarias han trabajado con sus albergues eh, con el apoyo de todo el equipo de salud de la familia del primer nivel de atención. Eh, de 800 comunidades indígenas que tenemos en Paraguay, 579 comunidades indígenas son cubiertas por el primer nivel de atención, quienes han llegado igual con esta pandemia a las comunidades para poder brindarle atención a las personas. Y contamos con 88 unidades de salud en la familia en zonas fronterizas donde los equipos de salud de la familia han realizado el monitoreo, el control de los ingresos de personas provenientes de, osas, de otras zonas. En cuanto a la promoción de salud, orientación a la población sobre las medidas higiénicas como el lavado de manos, la utilización correcta de mascarilla y distanciamiento físico. Como podrán ver, en los servicios se han seguido realizando las actividades promocionales como la charla, eh, orientar a los pacientes en el lavado correcto, la técnica del de lavado de manos. Sensibilización de la población y búsqueda activa, una actividad realizada por los agentes comunitarios, la figura de los agentes comunitarios se ha potenciado mucho con esta administración en la que los mismos salen a las casas, recorren, realizan censos, búsqueda activa de, de personas con, con síntomas respiratorios, se realizaron charlas en radios, spot, eh, eh, radiales, utilización de megáfonos que también fue una adquisición eh, conjunta con OPS y las visitas a los locales comerciales para verificación de la implementación del protocolo, del protocolo sanitario para los accesos. Las actividades promocion promocionales y de participación comunitaria enfocadas no solo en COVID dentro de las actividades que tenemos en el primer nivel de atención están contempladas la realización de los clubes de embarazadas, de enfermos crónicos, de enfermedades crónicas no transmisibles, y estas fueron realizadas con la implementación de las medidas preventivas según el protocolo establecido acá en el país. También la gobernanza en el primer nivel de atención, donde se articulan estrategias con autoridades locales, con líderes comunitarios para la mitigación de la situación epidemiológica. Trabajo conjunto con la policía, de las comisarías locales, intendentes, gobernadores, también la participación de la comunidad. Tenemos barrios muy populosos acá de Asunción, donde están voluntarios comunitarios trabajando conjuntamente con los personales de salud. También en la donación y adquisición de insumos de limpieza para los diferentes servicios. Y bueno, y la estrategia de expansión de las redes integradas e integrales de servicios de salud en Paraguay. Dentro de ellas tenemos una, un, una red eh, que está como la red modelo, de una micro, es la micro red de limpio, que está conformada por las cuatro, cuatro micro redes, como podrán ver. Eh, estas micro redes tienen un centro, está en rojo ahí el hospital distrital, que actualmente es un eh, servicio también respiratorio de la zona. Eh, cuenta con cuatro USF ampliadas, las cuales van a estar dotadas con, eh, para poder acceder a laboratorios y tener una atención con mayor horario de, de servicio para la gente. A su vez, están 16 unidades de salud de la familia que tienen un horario de atención hasta las 15 horas para la población. Este es un proyecto, o sea, está dentro del proyecto Salud para Todos, jefa, financiado por la Agencia de Cooperación Internacional de Corea, COICA, y OPS como evaluador externo de esta estrategia. Y bueno, eh, para decirle la atención primaria de salud en números acá en Paraguay, eh, hemos acumulado un total de 1.297.803 consultas en todas las unidades de salud de la familia, de los cuales 130.279 corresponden a cuadro respiratorio, IRA, eh, se realizaron 39.678 telemonitoreo, eh, seguimiento de, de pacientes en albergue a 7.681 y pacientes con síntomas graves de COVID a, fueron 242 per, eh, pacientes. Y bueno, entre las lecciones aprendidas podemos decir que no debemos debilitar el primer nivel de atención para fortalecer otros niveles. Acá en Paraguay se ha optado en que el primer nivel se eh, quede en el lugar donde está en la comunidad y no eh, desplazar a los profesionales para cubrir otros, otros niveles de atención. ¿Por qué? Porque hemos, eh, hemos visto que el primer nivel de atención conoce a su población, puede realizar el manejo de la gran mayoría de la patología, manejo de casos leves de forma ambulatoria, 
en la casa o telefónicamente, también monitoreándolo. Realizar las búsquedas activas de los casos. Trabaja fuertemente en la promoción de salud con la comunidad sobre las medidas higiénicas para, para evitar el contagio, orientando sobre signos de alarma. El trabajo en red es fundamental para una derivación oportuna de los casos y aquellos que presenten factores de riesgo, por sobre todo, eh, que puedan empeorar para llevarlo a un servicio de mayor complejidad. El soporte del segundo nivel para garantizar medios auxiliares de diagnóstico como laboratorio, rayo X, que son fundamentales también para un buen tratamiento, eh, para un buen diagnóstico y tratamiento. Y bueno, en cuanto a los desafíos, eh, nosotros le habíamos pasado en las, en las primeras presentaciones la baja cobertura que estamos teniendo a nivel país y por sobre todo los departamentos que han sido mayormente afectados. Y podemos decir que nuestro gran desafío es justamente aumentar el número de USF, garantizando con ello los equipamientos necesarios, recursos humanos, insumos, medicamentos necesarios para el buen funcionamiento y de esta manera mejorar nuestra cobertura y acceso Mejorar la concienciación de las personas, la familia, la comunidad, de la importancia del cambio de comportamiento social y cultural para disminuir los contagios. Paraguay tiene ciertas culturas muy par particulares como tomar el tereré, darse los besos, pasarse la mano y hemos, si bien es cierto, los casos se han ido controlando, eh, también vimos que la, la población en algún momento se relajó en cuanto a las medidas. Entonces, un gran desafío es seguir trabajando en la concienciación de la población. Fortalecer el proceso de informatización de las USF para contar con datos en tiempo y forma para la toma oportuna, oportuna de decisiones es también un gran desafío. That too is a big challenge. It's important to strengthen work with the first level so as to early on identify the patients. That is the network model we're trying to follow in the entire country. Also coordinate with the regional epidemiological offices to review cases, to report on cases, because we had a time where results were taking too long to arrive. If at the first level a case was detected, sometimes tests were not done in a timely fashion, guarantee availability of medication and inputs from the essential medication list. It is important to look at uh, these medications and sometimes we see a lack of medications. Also, we have to strengthen the family health units that are close to our borders and also those that are close to the indigenous communities. Sometimes, uh, there have been problems because of cultural differences in those areas. So that is something that we can share with you. Now, I thank you. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Barrios. That was an excellent presentation, just like the previous two. With this, I think that we can definitely move into the presentation that we're going to have from Mr. Hernán Luque. He is going to be speaking to us about the frame of reference used by PAHO right now to strengthen the resolution capacity of the first level of care during the COVID-19 pandemic. Hernán, please go ahead. Licenciado, por favor, desbloquee su, su micrófono. You need to unmute your microphone. It seems that we lost our sound.
Ahora te escucho, sí. I can hear you now. Perdona, Hernán, eh, pero eh, veo Hernán. que no se escucha. Eh, tienen que colocar el... Eh, We cannot hear you. That's what the chat is saying. Los que están en ese idioma. Gracias. Adelante, Hernán. Please go ahead, Hernán. The interpreter has no incoming sound. Perdona, perdona, um, Hernán, que, que te interrumpa. Excuse me for interrupting, but I still see in the chat that there is no audio. So I would ask our support technicians to help us. I wanted to remind you, those of you listening to Spanish, you have to switch to the Spanish channel it seems that there is sound there and those that are on english have to switch to english and also click on cancel original audio we can continue the interpreters have no incoming sound Perdón, un momento, eh, Hernán, eh, una pregunta. Hernán, I have a question. What uh, interpretation setting do you have on your computer? You shouldn't have any. It's not an interpreter. That's... Vaya abajo, a la barra de abajo, y fíjese. En... Go to the bottom bar. Look at uh, the interpretation icon there. See if you have that turned on. The lower bar at the bottom of your screen where you can see all the Zoom features. You should see interpretation under closed caption. Tell me what icons do you have at the bottom of your screen? Uh, 
The interpreter cannot hear Mr. Luque. I'm sorry. Sí, porque lo que pasa es que nadie lo está escuchando. The thing is, no one can hear you. A ver, puede, puede, puede hablar un poco de su presentación y por favor a los participantes les voy a preguntar aquí en el chat si lo, si lo escuchan. I'm going to ask the participants to let me know through the chat if you can hear Mr. Luque when he speaks. Perfecto, perfecto, licenciado. Parece que lo están escuchando. Puede continuar. The interpreters cannot hear him. Not on the floor. Unfortunately, the interpreter cannot interpret because she has no incoming sound. So the interpreters are standing by, but we have no incoming sound from Mr. Luque. Here in the chat, it says he signed in as an interpreter. That is why he's probably in our channel. I'm sorry. Perdón, Hernán, pero eh, hay un problema con... Hernán, there is a problem. There's a problem. And what I'm going to suggest is, while we're addressing this technical glitch, let's see if we can get both channels working, both English and Spanish. So perhaps in that way, I can ask some of the questions that are in the chat. I don't know if it's Hernan that they can't hear. No, they can hear Hernan. What we don't have is... I would ask Hernan to please leave the meeting and come back in. He came in as an interpreter, and that is why no one can hear him. And Casimiro... Casimiro, if you turn off your interpretation, that will make it easier. Fine. So if everyone can give us three minutes. Hernan, Hernan, please leave the meeting and come back in as a panelist so that we can all profit from 
hearing your remarks in both languages. Eh, Hernán, creo que te, que te veo de nuevo en pantalla. Hernán, I can see you again on the screen. Could you test your sound? Subir la presentación. Let's see if you can share your screen. These things happen when you use technology, but it's important that we be able to have interpretation into both languages. So we apologize. It seems we're just about there. Hernan, would you please test your audio? Sorry, Hernan, we cannot hear you. Hágame un favor, Hernan. Abajo. Hernan, at the bottom of your screen. On the far left, you can see the microphone icon. Click on that arrow and you'll see the audio settings there. Go to audio settings and choose the microphone from your computer or the headphones that you have on. De, deje de compartir la pantalla un segundo, Hernán. Hernán, stop, stop sharing the screen. Ok, ahí ya dejó de, de compartir su pantalla. Ahora abajo al lado. Ok, now at the bottom, on the far left, you can see the microphone settings. See if that is what is blocking your outgoing sound. Hello, Hernan. Hernan, can you hear me? 
Now I can hear you. Si se escucha, dice sin interpretación. Eh, usted tiene el, el, el icono de interpretación en la parte de abajo de su... De At the su... bottom of the screen, do you have the interpretation icon? Can you see it? Al lado de Q&A no, no tiene nada. Where it says Q&A, do you have... Do you have another icon there? Nada más. That's all you have? Okay. Since the presentation is in Spanish, you should leave the interpretation. I don't know if uh, the interpreters are going to be able to to um, interpret this presentation. Uh, if we're having some audio problems, okay? But stay on the English channel and we'll see if uh, uh, we can interpret for you. Okay, thank you very much. Adelante, licenciado. Go ahead, sir. And you can share your screen again. Ah, pero otra persona aquí dice no se escucha. Hemos perdido 20 minutos en esto. Y él antes no estaba como interpretar. Y yo creo que eso es algo que el host puede cambiar. I have no idea. Okay, fortunately, he's giving his talk and then he'll go away. Y la, la Amalia del Riego tiene todas sus preguntas ahí listas para preguntar. ¿Cómo hacemos? Hago yo un par de preguntas, tú un par... I mean, I really don't know. Como quieras. I think they should do the closing comments and call it a day. ¿Viste, ¿Viste que Yami nos mandó los números para la factura? La factura, sí, gracias por pedirlo. Yo ya hice mi factura. Yo todavía no. La hago mientras, en la computadora chiquita mientras estoy aquí. Para mí es la misma computadora, así que prefiero. Ah, sí, no sí, 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 cosa. sí. Ah, no, yo sí tampoco. Yo trato incluso a veces de hacer un restart antes de empezar estas cosas. Pero tuve que abrir el correo para cuando mandaron el nuevo enlace. Nunca he tenido problemas, pero para evitar. Yo encuentro, al principio yo hacía restart y todo eso, pero la verdad que he visto que no, no sí, cambia la cosa, sí. no tengo problemas, entonces sí. no hago un restart. Sí, yo tampoco he tenido. Con Kudo, sí, sí, pero no con Zoom. Cuando sé que va a ser una cosa con Kudo, me aseguro de, de tener más limpita la computadora. Ajá, ajá. O si he trabajado en otras cosas... Eh, por ejemplo, si he abierto Excel, Word, lo hago, pero sí, 100% preventivo y no porque haya tenido problemas.
la figura de un gestor al monitoreo de todos los pacientes tanto leves como moderados como de aquellos pacientes que por condiciones de vulnerabilidad ya sea por razones de embarazo ya sea por condiciones de diabetes, hipertensión o salud mental requieren tener un seguimiento y para lo cual el apoyo con tener estructurado algoritmos, guías protocolos que permitan eh, operativamente en el primer nivel de atención saber cómo manejar los casos y en qué momento referirlo a un, a un nivel superior. Y finalmente, la sexta recomendación es la transformación digital de los servicios en el primer nivel de atención. En esto eh, se ha trabajado mucho, hay experiencias de todo tipo en los países eh, utilizando la teleconsulta o telemedicina en primer nivel de atención, eh, también la importancia que tiene el, el uso de los expedientes en la medida de las posibilidades, el uso de expedientes y medios digitales para poder realizar eh, pruebas en tiempos reales, eh, poder aprovechar el, el, la tecnología digital que permita tener un registro de datos de pacientes en línea y de esa manera poder tener un, no solamente un monitoreo de los pacientes, sino al mismo tiempo poder hacer una programación y coordinación adecuada del traslado y movilización de pacientes que sean necesarios. Aparte de, eh, evidentemente, todo el registro de información que se requiere para darle seguimiento al monitoreo de las estadísticas y del comportamiento de la pandemia y su impacto en la población. Bien, de manera resumida, pues con esto eh, queríamos hacer esta breve presentación. Eh, queremos eh, pedir excusa por todas las, las, las inconvenientes que hemos tenido y muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a Hernán y, y de nuevo disculpas por eh, los problemas de técnicos. Eh, como realmente eh, se nos pasó bastante el tiempo, yo eh, no vamos a poder hacer una, una gran discusión. Hay muchos comentarios en el chat, ah, también en la sesión de, de preguntas. Um, eh, quizás voy a dirigir eh, una pregunta a cada uno de los panelistas ah, de los países eh, y con eso eh, podríamos eh, cerrar la la actividad. Así que, y bueno, una para, por supuesto, eh, una pregunta para Hernán. Entonces, inicio con una pregunta que veo en, el, eh, en la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Eh, esta va dirigida a, um, eh, a ver, que tienen nombres, eh, al, al doctor Angulo. Eh, doctor Angulo, si podía compartir la experiencia en cuanto a las implicaciones presupuestarias 
para la Caja de la Seguridad Social en Costa Rica de lo que significa eh, la pandemia. Eh, adelante, doctor Angulo. Buenas, ¿me escuchan? ¿Sí? Uh -huh. Sí, escuchamos. ¿Se escucha? Ok. Oh, la institución tiene un presupuesto regular, como tiene y tiene un presupuesto regular en, en cuanto a lo que es inversión, digamos, en todo lo que era la respuesta esperada pre-COVID de, de, de todo el proceso de atención de los problemas de salud de la población en un paquete de intervenciones está diseñada. Lo que ha, obviamente las implicaciones en términos de inversión han sido amplias y eso, eso obliga a modificaciones presupuestarias que son propias, se pueden, este, se pueden hacer modificaciones presupuestarias para financiar todo el proceso de atención, como fue la implementación del Centro, del centro este, Nacional de Atención de COVID, que llevó toda la recabación de un hospital, otro hospital sin una ala de un hospital psiquiátrico de adecuarlo, todo lo que son las plazas y todo lo que son el proceso de atención, todo lo que son insumos para diagnósticos y tratamientos, pruebas diagnósticas y todo lo que es tipo de protección, se ha realizado la inversión haciendo modificaciones. Recientemente el Estado ha hecho un aporte dentro de la nueva en el marco de inversión para asegurarle financiamiento a la institución. Ha habido la institución de financia por cuotas obreras, por obreros patronales y asociado al desempleo. Obviamente ha habido una disminución del ingreso, pero hasta el día de hoy ha logrado irse haciendo las modificaciones presupuestarias para seguirle dando contención a, el, a la epidemia y generando la búsqueda de recursos frescos también, pero de al día de hoy no ha sido este a pesar de que la inversión ha aumentado no ha, no al momento actual se sigue manteniendo todo el proceso de atención y todo el reforzamiento de la red para, para atender la pandemia. Uh -huh. sí. No sé si, es, si si me explico, pero en términos generales es una redecuación de la inversión, como dijimos en el en, la, en el inicio de la presentación, es redireccionar recursos. Sí. Eh, gracias, doctor Angulo. Hay una pregunta específicamente para eh, la doctora Barrios y preguntan cuál es la experiencia eh, en términos de eh, si se ampliaron los roles de la, del personal de enfermería para ampliar la capacidad resolutiva del primer nivel y si es así, ¿cómo lo hicieron? Adelante, doctora Barrios. No sé si me escuchan. Ya. Eh, justamente en, en, en las leyes vigentes hoy día de enfermería acá a nivel país, entre las funciones de, de la enfermera como tal, ¿verdad? Eh, no contempla la de realizar medicaciones eh, como tal, ¿verdad? Eh, pero sí, eh, así lo, lo contempla en el personal, en el, la licenciada en obstetricia, sí, sí, sí. Tal, sí puede eh, realizar, eh, medicar, eh, puede diagnosticar y medicar a un paciente, principalmente en el área de, de su profesión. En este caso específico, en vista que nosotros no tenemos contemplado que, la, que las licenciadas en enfermería puedan hacer medicaciones sin una prescripción del médico, lo que hemos hecho es para garantizar el servicio a nivel país, porque hemos dividido ese equipo humano que le estaba mencionando, de, integrado por el médico, el licenciado y auxiliar, designándole funciones a cada uno del equipo para poder de esa manera garantizar la atención. En este caso, lo que las licenciadas en enfermería han hecho, porque la gran mayoría de las USF cuentan en su mayoría con licenciadas en enfermería, el número de licenciadas en obstetricia es menor, entonces eh, esas licenciadas en enfermería cumplieron el rol de poder eh, realmente diagnosticar y eh, brindar un, un tratamiento. En aquellos casos que tenían eh, ciertas dudas era con acompañamiento telefónico también de su médico, porque la, US, el, la unidad de salud de la familia se dividió en dos partes con acceso diferenciado tanto para el paciente como para el personal eh, de salud para de esa manera evitar justamente que haya... Eh, una contaminación de, de las áreas y, y también que los profesionales puedan de repente eh, mezclarse con el área respiratoria. Entonces las licenciadas jugaron un papel importante.
importante porque garantizaron realmente la atención a aquellos cuadros que no eran respiratorios. Y las, las auxiliares en enfermerías y técnicos en enfermería lo que han hecho es garantizar justamente las prestaciones de nuestras vacunaciones, de los procedimientos, del control del niño y garantizar la entrega del, del complemento alimentario a los niños los agentes comunitarios en su rol de salir eh, a la comunidad, a hacer su búsqueda activa, de, sensibil de sensibilizar. Por ende, todo el equipo de esa unidad... Creating se... mindfulness. So the whole system had to be restructured so as to assure care to patients. And that is why we pointed out that the nurses have played a vital role because they could say, oh no, that's not part of our functions and we're not going to do that. But no, they have definitely stepped up to the plate and this is the year of the nurse and they have played a very important role in that connection to assure care. Thank you, Dr. Barrios, for your answer. The next question is for Casimiro. Could you tell us about the situation about mental health and what policies have been implemented to strengthen the first level of care for mental health in the COVID um, Casimiro? That's a, um, that's a very important question that I don't think I mentioned in my participation, but it's been uh, one, of the, one of the aspects that we'll be looking when we look to the health workforce. Um, both there has been training being done in terms of infection prevention and control, but also in terms of uh, uh, social and mental psychosocial support, uh, because we see, and we see since the beginning, since in March, that the, there has been, um, you know, the health professionals are also, you know, they also have families, they also worry, um, and in that sense, uh, has been an important um, aspect, the health workforce. Um, also, the, the, the overall community, and there's been um, a lot of initiatives in, uh, in Jamaica and supported by PAHO, um, not just in the health sector, but going to the other sectors. You know, now that it's talking about reopening the schools, there's also a lot of, of concerns. And, and so that as aspect has been also taken into account um, the, psych the psychosocial support and mental health for the overall community. Thank you. Thank you, Casimiro. Esta pregunta, no por... The last question, it's not really the last one because there are lots of questions in the chat. And perhaps when we conclude, we can talk about future activities and hopefully with fewer technological issues. But this uh, is a question for Hernan. It comes from a health worker and she inquires, what measures have to be taken by municipal health workers in addition to talking about the health security measures? Hernan, could you address this question, please? We cannot hear Hernan. The interpreters are unable to hear Hernan. Sí, ahora te, te escuchamos. Adelante. Amalia said she can hear Hernan, but the interpreters cannot hear him. I think Hernan is still occupying the interpretation channel. We can only hear Flo and are unable to hear Hernan, I'm sorry. Disculpa, Hernán, pero 
pero no te están escuchando. Creo que hay problemas de conexión de nuevo. I apologize, Hernán, but uh, people cannot hear you. We have some kind of uh, connection problem or issue with you. Adelante, Hernán. Go ahead, Hernán. Eh, gracias a Hernán. Eh, creo que con esto eh, llegamos al final de la Thank you, Hernán. This brings us to the end of our session. As I pointed out earlier, we have a lot of uh, questions and comments in the chat. We will go through them and we will get in touch with you later. Let me now offer the floor to Dr. Anselm Hennis. He is the director of the non-communicable diseases and mental health department and one of the individuals who helped develop the reference document which quite honestly has been an effort bringing together all the technical areas at PAHO. So with that uh, I offer the floor to Anselm. Um, it's indeed a pleasure to be here and congratulations to the entire team and which who worked interprogrammatically in this document. And really, we've heard many different views this afternoon. We've heard about the disruptions of services due to COVID-19, particularly as they've affected the first level of care. We've learned about some of the responses, scaling up of um, emergency services and hospital services, increasing the personal complement. We've also heard how the disruptions have particularly affected essential services, such as those for NCD, cancer, mental health, um, malaria, HIV, tuberculosis, family planning, etc. We also heard a bit about the interplay between NCDs and the pandemic. Um, so many things to be learned and we've also heard how 80% um, of countries defined essential health services, which was a point shared um, by Dr. Fitzgerald. But in sum, we've learned that COVID has laid bare gaps in uh, the provision of um, health services and care, fragmentation, lack of existing investments, lack of maturity in the integrated health service networks. And so there are many things that we learned that went wrong because things weren't as um, advanced as they should have been. But we've also learned that, um, that health systems to respond have to be agile and resilient, which means they have to be able to ensure the continuity of care, so they're resilient, and also they have to sustainably be able to respond to and meet the demand for essential health services while at the same time managing the new challenge of COVID. We also heard about um, the issues of vulnerability, 
populations that are particularly at risk, namely the indigenous Indians, those who are impoverished and poor, and even ethnic minorities and migrants. And we heard some interesting examples in what was presented this afternoon about how some health systems have had an outreach specifically to those living in vulnerable situations and the importance of social protection. We also heard about the need for partnerships, the fact this is far bigger than the healthcare systems, the need for intersectoral approaches across governments, as well as multi-sectoral approaches, including civil society and NGOs, particularly of great importance as we're about to reopen our economies. Now, this technical report that was discussed this afternoon on strengthening the results of capacity of the first level of care um, um, really had a number of key points to help guide the way that um, we all move forward as a region. The importance of strengthening the health teams in the first level of care. The need to integrate the containment activities for COVID-19 with those of essential services. The need to reorganize, expand and reinforce the first level of care. The establishment of management of networks for the, um, for the conduct, the coordination integration of services, the need for case management to assure the continuation of care, and also the, um, the digital transformation for first level of care services. As our economies begin to open, and we recognize there are increased challenges to our healthcare systems, we have to continue the transformation of our systems to be able to respond. So I think really, this has been a really interesting discussion and debate this afternoon. There are many more questions than we've been able to respond to. And I, I really will um, draw your attention to following this document and looking at the lessons there to be learned. And I'm sure this is just one of many discussions going forward. So thank you so much, Amalia. Thank you very much, Anselm. Um, y aquí tengo una, um, and here I have una, un comentario último en el a last comment in the chat. With which I'd like to bring this uh, webinar to an end. It's uh, from a colleague in Mexico, and the comment is that he would have truly liked to hear about uh, country experiences such as United States, Brazil, and Mexico, these being the countries most affected by COVID. And yes, I do believe we need to hear about the experience from all countries. And actually right now, it's important to, to uh, combine reviews of experiences to draw lessons for the preparation of health systems, in particular focusing on service networks and first level of care. We know that we're going to have the pandemic around for some time yet, and these lessons learned will be extremely important to ensure that in the future, we can save more lives, we may protect our populations, and hopefully come out of this with strengthened resilience among our population as well as our health services. So we will continue to be in touch with you for future conversations. We thank you very much for your participation. The document is already uploaded on the PAHO website, and we hope you will find it useful and will provide you with support. Thank you very much.